we're going to go into our next session, um, which is the 100 year life, the extra time. How are we going to spend our extra time? We talked a lot about how we're going to be able to live forever if we want to in the first session um, and all the hot end of research in that space. But now we're going to really focus on how we're going to live healthier, longer lives. Um, how should we use our extra time? What can we make, what can we do to make sure we live longer, better, and happier from birth to old age. Um, and also going back to the point that I made around the um, National Strategy for Healthy Aging, how can we give five extra healthy years to all British citizens by 2035 while closing the social gap? There's still a lot of health inequality that needs to be part of our solution, how we address that. And the big focus of our talk today is going to be on the social determinants of health. How you know, when you recognize, and a lot of the focus I know yesterday was very much on the, the sick care, the sick data, which makes up 10% of that social determinants of health. Really, if we're going to really um, maneuver and look at the preventative health aspect, this is all around the 90%, which is genomics, which we talked a little bit in the, in the previous session. Um, it's also social and behavioral data. So this is really where it's at in terms of social determinants of health. So we're going to have a little bit more focus on that in this session and look at social connections, the role of purpose, um, what matters most in the end, and, and having a happy death if we don't choose to be immortal. Um, so I've got a fantastic panel. Uh, we're going to have, um, uh, so we've got a great panel representing all aspects of uh, expertise, and I'll, I'll introduce them when they come up on stage. But first, um, we're really, really fortunate to have Baroness Camilla Cavendish, um, who is a, an FD columnist. Uh, she does a lot of writing. She's a former head of policy, um, David Cameron. Uh, she also is um, a, uh, a senior fellow at Harvard um, and also the author of a book, which is probably many of you have seen already been promoted in the press, has been, had, has been having quite a, a big um, a sort of uh, press coverage already. Uh, it's called Extra Time. So um, we're very lucky to have Camilla. She's going to set the scene for us. And so I'm going to hand over to Camilla for, for 20 minutes. Thanks very much, Tina. Can you hear me at the back? Yeah? yeah. So, about a year ago, I was sitting in the office of Professor David Sinclair at Harvard Medical School, and we were talking about some of the amazing discoveries that he's made uh, in terms of gene therapies. Um, he's one of the scientists who's actually managed to double the lifespan of mice, and some of what he's doing is clearly not just increasing life expectancy, but improving that last decade, improving the endings and reducing what sort of that sort of ghostly half twilight of senescence that really we all want to avoid. And David was talking about the fact that he'd just been at a drinks party with Harvard donors, most of whom were very skeptical. And, you know, they said, why should we believe in you? You know, there's a whole lot of um, anti-aging pills which are sort of beginning to come to fruition, and compounds, which many of you will know about. A lot of skepticism, but afterwards, they were all privately saying, tell me what to take. <laughs> and I realized then that I think getting ahead of aging is now the new status symbol, and I think there's going to be a lot of money in it. But getting it right is going to be really important, and we need to make the possibility available to everyone which David Sinclair feels very strongly about, and so do I. So we're going to talk a lot in the panel about how technology can, can help with some of this, but also we're going to talk about the inequalities that we need to avoid. So I think we're on the cusp of some really radical changes in terms of jobs, in terms of education, in terms of health, and it's very exciting. And my interest actually is not in living longer. I mean, I think you talked earlier about some of the Silicon Valley billionaires who are trying to achieve escape velocity from death. Uh, fascinating concept. But my personal interest is basically in trying to improve that last decade. And to, in order to write this book, I've been to a whole lot of different countries to try to find people who are helping to do that. And I wrote the book. I started writing the book uh, two years ago after my father died. And he was someone who on his 50th birthday, suddenly said to me, I just think everything's over. And we were sitting in Cornwall on this cliff, which was his favorite place to be, and I was very small, I was pretty young, 
and I thought 50 is older than I can imagine. But he really felt that everything was over. And from that point on, he started to say things like, oh, I'm a bit too old for that, can't try that. And when my mother left him, the biggest issue in the divorce proceedings was our cats, our two cats, which went with her. And my father didn't get another cat, although he missed them desperately because he kept thinking, well, I don't know how long I've got. And, you know, if I had a cat, it would be left homeless. And who would I give it to? And he lived till 86 in really, really good health, and he never had cats to keep him company. So after he died, I started thinking about that and thinking about how often age becomes a barrier. And I called the book Extra Time, because actually what all the evidence now shows is it's not old age that's getting longer, it's middle age. And we are now looking at a large period of healthy, productive extra time in many of our lives that the institutions are completely unaware of and have not caught up with. So one in four Brits and Americans is now unretiring. They're going back to work, sometimes five years after they stopped. Some for financial reasons, quite a lot because they really miss the camaraderie, the sense of purpose, and the connection. We found 70-somethings who are runners and cyclists who are biologically 30 years younger than their chronological age because they have been exercising continuously and doing aerobic exercise for a long period of time. And we're seeing the instance of dementia actually falling by a fifth over the last 20 years in some countries. That doesn't mean that obviously dementia isn't a major problem we have to tackle because we've got more old people. But the, the individual risk of dementia is falling, and that's really good news. And the Japanese have a word for this group. They call them the young old. Young old in Japan is from 60 to at least 75, sometimes older. And their doctors and geriatricians do not look at that group of people in the same way as they look at the old old who are frail and who do need care and, and our help. And there are plenty of people, I've interviewed many of them for the book, the world's oldest stewardess in America, for example, who's 82, who is still flying the uh, Boston to Washington shuttle on a daily basis. There are plenty of people out there who are living examples of extra time and who are lucky, in her case, to have employers who really believe in them. But too often, we don't value that wisdom and experience that older people bring. I think if you go right back to John Perry Barlow and his declaration of the independence of cyberspace, if you remember that far back, um, you know, he made a really important distinction at the time which was really powerful between digital natives and digital immigrants. And I think the overhang of that is still with us. And given that we're at a technology conference, I just thought I'd mention this because I have interviewed so many employers and older people who just believe they can't do tech. And actually, more and more older people are doing tech all the time you know, some of the panelists will talk about this. I mean, they're doing it completely naturally. More and more older people are in the gig economy. They're starting businesses, and they don't have a problem with tech. But we've got this thing in our heads that over a certain age, you're still a digital immigrant. And I, I think that we have, to, um, we have to help people overcome that, but we have to realize that, that that is out of date. So we've got two trends. We've got people living longer, and we've got birth rates falling dramatically in most countries outside sub-Saharan Africa. And that means that everything is going to have to change, including even our notion of family, because fewer and fewer people are having children. So the kind of support networks that we have to build for the future don't always involve family. If you go to Germany, you can find wonderful multi-generational houses where grandparents are coming together with toddlers, but they're not blood relatives. And grandparents are helping single parents, but they're not their own children. And I think we need to start thinking quite creatively about those new kinds of relationships that we're going to have to build in this new world. And of course, the big challenge, one of the big challenges, as Tina said, is that we're not aging equally. So the single best predictor of how you in this room are all going to age is what level of education you have. And for most of you, it's pretty high. And from about 40, we start to see people who are less educated starting to suffer certain functional limitations in walking, all sorts of things, that we are not seeing in more educated people on the whole. And by 60, the difference between graduates and non-graduates in terms of health is really significant. And at 85, half of graduates are living with no functional limitations, whereas many, many others are suffering from multiple chronic diseases, which are a major problem ethically and financially. And Japan is really one of the only countries in the world which has started to grapple effectively with this. 
it's targeted healthy life expectancy and it started to reduce the gap. So between 2013 and 2016, Japan gave the average Japanese man one extra year of healthy life. And they did that mainly by focusing on some really simple things. They're focusing on reducing drinking, reducing what's left of smoking. They're focusing on the number of steps people take a day. I mean, imagine trying to do that in this country, telling you know, people how many steps to take a day. But nevertheless, it's really important. They're focusing on reducing salt intake. They're focusing on blood pressure. And they're getting people to live much healthier lifestyles. Now, when I ran the policy unit in number 10, one of the things I did was to introduce a sugar tax on fizzy drinks. Um, we did that because we felt that obesity is an epidemic. I believe obesity is making people old before their time, and it is stifling the life chances of some of the poorest people in our society. And I think we need to start treating sugar the way we treat nicotine. A lot of research shows sugar is addictive, and it's very hard to give up. And what we're seeing is that you can significantly improve your health across every indicator if you read the leaflet and do what they tell you to do in terms of exercise and diet and so on. But it's really, really hard for people to do that. And when diabetes costs slightly less than 10% of the NHS budget, type 2 diabetes, we really need to tackle this and we need to be much more strong uh, from the government end about doing that. And we also need to be much more ambitious for older people at a later stage. So there's a wonderful um, software gaming company which is working with occupational therapists to help older people with strength and balance training. Right? So strength and balance training sounds very dull, but it actually can make the difference between someone being in a care home or being independent. And you can improve someone's strength and balance at almost any age. And these guys have a wonderful program which involves things like, you know, they've got a, an auction program where you can bid if you stand up They've got a piano program where you can change the keys by standing up and sitting down. These things are phenomenally powerful because they are visual, they are using proper gaming technology, and they're able to, to sense where people are in the room. There's lots of very clever initiatives like this, but they are not breaking through into the wider NHS. Take neuroscience as another example. So for years and years, we thought the brain wasn't plastic beyond a certain age. We now know that it remains plastic forever. We know that you create your brain creates more new brain cells all the time. The big question is how do you incorporate those brain cells into the functional circuits of the brain long term? And that gets harder to do as we get older. But what the research is showing is that older people can still learn at all ages. They learn differently to younger ones and they need to keep learning because unless you keep challenging yourself, really challenging yourself, not just doing a crossword puzzle, your brain does not incorporate those cells into the functional circuits. A lot of experiments being done out of La Jolla and other places on rodents which have shown, these, shown this has been really effective. And again, we need to start understanding there's a huge market for brain training apps. Some of you may be creating them. Some of them have very little science behind them. But there are a few which really work. There are a few which seem to have really proven science. Speed processing is one of them. Again. You know, the regulators have been a little hazy about that. They're not ready quite yet to go with it. But we need to start looking at those things because actually some of those things are going to make a fundamental difference to people's health. But we need to start signaling to people which are the things that work and, frankly, which are the things which they could waste a lot of money on. So I guess there's a, there's a, a few areas where technology can really help with this. But on the whole, it, for me, it's technology plus people. So a lot of what I look at and I've looked at in the past is caring, compassion, nursing, all that, which is very human. Um, and it seems to me that most of the things that we're going to be talking about here are incredibly useful technology and data, but they've got to be used. It's technology plus teamwork, if you like. So AI, faster diagnosis, we all know about that. We've got to start retraining doctors to be able to translate that, to explain to people about probabilities, to have the EQ, if you like, to start grappling with that data. Most people don't understand probability. If you say to most people, well, you know, I've discovered that your susceptibility to this disease is X, it's going to be very hard for most patients to understand what that means. That's a huge challenge. There's wonderful equipment out there. I mean, I spend a lot of time in Japan, and I do think that there are some marvelous 
robotic solutions to some of this. The Panasonic bed, for example, which is a wheelchair that turns into bed, is just marvellous. Um, the exoskeletons that help people lift are marvellous. The companion robots are fascinating because they do seem to be able to connect to people with dementia and it's quite clear that older people will follow a, a robot like Pepper in a series of exercises where they won't follow the human physiotherapist who's standing next to him. So there are some really interesting things that are going on, but we need to do this in conjunction with, with human beings because I think there's the risk of this is that we're creating marvelous surveillance systems which will allow more and more of us, frankly, to remain 200 miles away from our parents and occasionally check the CCTV and be able to see if they've lifted the kettle. Uh, but, you know, we still are going to have to drive there when something goes wrong. And I, I think we need to start talking about th that challenge as well. So one story just to illustrate this, and I'll, I'll, I'll finish quite soon. Um, BMW, the car company, about 10 years ago, realized that it was running out of skilled workers because obviously we all fear automation. But one of the things that aging populations are doing is, is, is creating labor shortages, shortages of skilled labor. It's actually quite a good time to be in your 50s or 60s because people are going to need those jobs. BMW didn't want to lose its skilled workers. Creating um, luxury cars is a really, and assembling components is a really skilled job. They created an older workers' production line where the average age was over 50, which in, in car manufacturing is quite old. And everybody ridiculed this. They said, oh, my God, what are you doing? Even the guys on the production line didn't want to be singled out as old. They did workshops. They asked them how they could help them to work better. They made 70 small changes. I mean, everything from magnifying lenses to better lighting to different kinds of chairs. Quite cheap. The results were astonishing. So productivity went up by 7% on that line. It became the most productive line in the factory. Absence rates fell by 5% to, I think, about 2%. And the number of defects fell to zero. Now, that story is often told as a story about technology. It's told as a story about exoskeletons and all the kind of things that, that they did to physically help people. I think it's also a story about belonging. It's also a story about telling those workers that they were valuable, asking them what they thought, and saying, you have a future in this company. So I just think, you know, before we, before we rush to adopt all the technological solutions, we need to also have the story that goes with it. So I went to a care home in Holland about a year ago, which was most care homes, if you've been to any, uh, Max has here, I mean, they're fairly depressing places. This was in a really awful concrete block. It looked terrible from the outside. Inside, it is one of the most inspiring places I've ever been because it has eight university students who live there with the residents. It has some robots. It has a gym. And the residents go up to 100, and they're still using that gym. And it's very, very ambitious for people. And one of the students I interviewed, he said, well, the thing that's changed for me is that since I came here, I no longer see these people as old. He'd made great friends with a woman called Marty, who was 91. He said, I don't see a 91-year-old woman anymore. I see my good friend who has many different parts to her life. And of course, that's what happens when you start to break down barriers. But one of the most interesting things that Care Home had done, and by the way, they don't have any different budget to anybody else. They just decided to treat people as neighbors rather than residents. They call them neighbors. They used to have an application form which had 100 questions on it when you wanted to join. They've recreated that form, and they've only got three questions. And the questions are these. Number one, who are you? Number two, who were you? Number three, who are you going to be? Now, imagine asking that question of anybody over 50, let alone people over 70. And I mean, this home, the average age is, is 80. That puts a completely different spin on their ambitions for these people. And I think that's something we need to do more generally. Around the world, there are quite a lot of examples of where elder people have lived much healthier lives and much more fulfilling lives because they've had a sense of being needed all the research shows if you have a sense of purpose, if you feel useful, it actually translates into better health. And in this country, we do a lot of sort of nice tea parties, but we don't always remember to create tea parties with a purpose. So if you go to Japan, you go to their silver centers, you find incredibly old women sitting around tables making things for local businesses. 
Calligraphy skills are very valued in Japan, and so they spend hours beautifully writing these official certificates for companies. This is real work. It's not makeup. It's also a coffee morning, and it's a gossip, and it's everything else. But there are 95-year-old women who will take two buses every day to get to that center because that is what gives them a sense of purpose. And I fear that's something that we have lost in this society because we don't really value wisdom and experience. And I'll leave you with one last story. Um, in Zimbabwe, a psychiatrist called Dixon Chibanda realized a few years ago that he just didn't have enough resource. I mean, he's in a huge country with terrible emotional, psychological problems. He's one of a handful of psychiatrists. And one of his patients killed herself. And he rang the mother and he said, why didn't she come? She was supposed to come to the appointment. And the mother said she couldn't afford the bus fare to come and see you. And he then realized he had to take his practice out of the hospital into the villages. And he thought, well, who can I recruit? I need to recruit therapists for the villages. And he couldn't afford professionals. So he tried a number of different types of people. And the people who were most effective were grandmothers. They had the empathy. They had the listening skills. They had the patience. And those grandmothers actually, in a randomized controlled trial, proved to be more effective at treating depression than the standardized hospital care in Zimbabwe. But even more interesting than that, the grandmothers themselves benefited because they ran a long-term study looking at their own cognitive development and, lo and behold, found that the grandmothers were developing cognitively, felt more valued, and were a lot happier as a result. So I think that's just a, a way of saying there are a lot of aspects to how we achieve this extra five years of healthy life. And when all of you think about who you are going to be, and most of you have a very long way to go. I hope that part of what you'll think about is how can you start to make a difference to make our extra time worth living? Because we're all going to grow old. Hopefully, we're all going to have the extra time. But we need to work together to change our attitudes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Camilla. Um, I'm going to invite uh, the other panelists onto the stage, please. <clears throat> and then we'll... I don't know if that was told to say. Thank you very much. So make sure we've got water. Yeah, so, uh, so Camilla has uh, set the scene for some really, really crunchy issues, really. Um, on how we can uh, live our extra time, live a, a happier, longer life. Um, and you know, some interesting themes around um, values, around caring, empathy, connectivity, social connections, um, all these uh, purpose. Um, these are sort of themes that have come out. I'm just going to, before we kind of go into questions, and I've obviously got a, a number of questions, um, I just wanted to ask each and every one of you sitting on the panel, for you personally, what do you think is the secret to what will be your happy, long life? Kate first. Okay, um, do I need, oh, I've got a microphone here. That's fine. Um, okay, so I work on social and cultural impact of artificial intelligence. I'm an academic. And my area of expertise is actually sex and technology. And I'm going to actually say that I think the secret to uh, a longer life is, is to have intimacy in your older age. And so not just to combat loneliness, but to have that connection with, with other humans. Um, so that's going to be my answer, is sex. <laughs> sex. Well, sex in old age, definitely, yes. I can justify that in a moment. <laughs> and everyone will, will, will get a chance to learn a little bit more about Kate's research. Um, Camilla. Um, I, was saying earlier, I was saying earlier to Kate that I avoided the topic of sex in my book because I just thought I can't, can't, can't go handle there. that one. Um, I think it's activity. I mean, for me, the evidence is absolutely overwhelming about aerobic activity. And I, I, just, I think we ought to be more honest about that because I think a lot of people worry about diet. But in worrying about diet, we're trying to avoid actually getting out there and exercising, and that's the sort of grim truth. Yeah. Letitia. Yeah, so, so for me, so I do, I do work uh, around bringing emerging technology and innovation in 
and, and we have three projects running at the moment uh, with um, you know the older population. And I think with that experience, I do think for me, uh, growing older is all about social connection, being kept connected with my family, which is very far away most of the time. So I think kind of maintaining that connect with my grandchildren, my children, uh, but also with my community. Uh, I think I think you know typically when you're growing older you, 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 your horizon is shrinking a little bit because you're losing some of your friends and all of that and it's keeping that social connect and, and activity in some way but much more on the social side. Max, what's your secret? <coughs> um, I think it's actually, we've seen a lot about that already. I think we know, we know the truth, right? You know, I think social connection, absolutely yeah. agree. Uh, physical and mental stimulation, absolutely. Um, and, and I think we can talk about it a little further, but there's a lot there. Um, we call it the life curve or the ADL curve. If you actually stimulate the right way, you can see the difference. And then I think the sense of purpose and meaning is actually very true. I think this is something we often forget. It's very important as well. So just with these, um, I'm going to ask all the panelists, I know Camilla's had her chance on, as a keynote speaker, but with, all, with those key things, how with the work that you're doing, and, and you know, I'll give you a few minutes just to go, go through in terms of how that comes how that's come through into, in your research or your, or your businesses. Kate, first. Right. So my research um, for the past few years has been around intimacy and technology and sex. And one of the things I discovered when I was doing my research um, was that people are having sex right into old age. We have evidence from NAPSAL, which is the National Survey of Sexual Attitudes and Lifestyles, um, to show that people in their 80s and even 90s um, are still sexually active. And it doesn't need to be what we all expect to hear as sex, which is kind of tends to be this, you know, penis, vagina, orgasm thing. It's, it's, it's wider than that, broader than that. Um, but also the English Longitudinal Study of Aging has shown that this is also happening. And in the past few years, um, groups, charities like the Alzheimer's Society has raised awareness of this as well. So what happens, we put family members perhaps into nursing homes. Those nursing homes, as Camilla has said, they can be quite grim at times. There's not very much privacy. You know, they're in a single bed with a window in the door and no locks. They might be in with a partner. They might have lost a partner. They might be forming new friendships and relationships. So it's not just about sort of sex as we, as we might see it now. And of course, these are people who, you know, give birth to us. They, they, they're, they have sex, you know. It's, we, we stop thinking of old people as being sexual beings, but, you know, they got there first. Um, and so I think that that feeling of closeness and intimacy is really important. Um, one of the women who runs Natsal, Kath Mercer, um, I, did a, I did a talk with her recently, and she was saying that they interview people about their lifestyles, and she said there was a couple that, that she interviewed in their 80s, and every day they go upstairs and get undressed and get into bed together just to be close, just to feel that closeness. And I think that that is something that gets so overlooked as we age, um, but it's such a, a fundamental part of life. And I honestly believe that, that it's something that we should um, think about and encourage, but the problem is when we see illnesses such as dementia, Alzheimer's, there becomes issues around consent. So, of course, we don't know whether or not someone can willingly consent if they're not able to understand what's really happening around them. So I think it's definitely an, it's an area where technology can play a role. Um, we're a little bit squeamish, but, excuse me, squeamish about it, um, but it is something that we shouldn't neglect. But there are other aspects of it as well, so the emotional side and that connection, um, I think that feeds into it too. Okay. And uh, Letitia, I know you're doing some amazing work with um, AI and Alexa and companionship addressing loneliness, which is one of the biggest, ki well, the biggest killer of, of older people. How, how is the work that you're doing sort of, um, has made you come up with the, 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 um, the secret that you had around social So people? when we did start uh, some of our project with Age UK or with Hanover Housing Association, we really wanted to try to see our voice AI or some of that tech in people's home would help them in their day to day, you know, live longer and happier. Uh, and, and we didn't really want to position that as a companionship uh, uh, kind of helper because we thought it would maybe be a bit creepy. But actually, all the feedback after one year trial with the UK and six months with ANOVA, where you know everybody was coming back to us and saying, "This is this is just like a companion in a room." You know, my wife used to do that. Now, you know, Alexa does it. So, and, and that feeling of connection uh, being reestablished and cross generation 
generation as well. So, you know, one of our um, participants, she used to not talk so much with her grandchildren because her grandchildren are on text and things like that. And, you know, and she would normally pick up call or they would be busy or they're far away in a different time zone and they don't really find moment of connecting. And just the fact of doing voice text on one side for the older person and then on the other side, you know, normal texting, you know, reconnected generation ac across the patch. So I think there's definitely something there, you know, around technology enabling social connection, uh, companionships, uh, in, in, and making life much better. You know, a lot of those people don't necessarily speak to uh, a lot of people in, 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 in their daytime. We had that dramatic situation where a lady, she had a, weep, a hip issue and she was saying, Leticia, in the winter, if I, if I actually run to the phone and, and miss the call, nobody's going to call me in a month. Yeah? Um, so having voice enabled and some of that tech in the home help you know, uh, bridge some of those gaps and help in the day to day massively. Yeah. Fantastic. And Max? <coughs> yeah, it's, qu it's quite related actually. So what we do uh, at Birdie, we provide a range of digital solutions, um, AI, machine learning, and, and connected devices in the house to not only help and empower the care community to deliver better preventative tailored care, but also to help older adults live longer and healthier at home. And the idea here, I think, it's very much uh, related to what Camilla said earlier. By the way, the book is brilliant. My whole team is reading it, so, and she just didn't pay me, but I think it's really a, a great way to... Uh, it is a great to, book. Yeah, it's a great book, so I highly recommend it. Um, I think it's, it's about saying, well, uh, there is an opportunity here to actually help older adults live uh, better lives because we know that you know, older adults actually die later, but they fall sick at the same age. Mm -hmm. So it's not about lengthening life, it's about healthy aging. Mm -hmm. And we know also, and there's plenty of research showing that, Newcastle University is a very good example, that if you put the right things in place, you could actually offer a much better healthy um, aging journey for these older adults. Um, and it starts with a few things. In our, in our case, what we're focusing on is to say, instead of delivering uh, reactive standard care packages or care, why don't we focus on preventative tailored care? Um, so we really anticipate the needs and we design the, the care based on the needs of the patients. And we see a huge difference in the way they react to that. That's the first step. So we try to empower the whole care community, including the families, but also the care professionals. And later on, we'd like to nudge the older adults themselves to take care of themselves, which is also extremely powerful. You say, how can I coach older adults to say, well, you want to take care of your own health and you want to age better. These are the ways and the solutions to do that. And includes a lot of different things, including digital technologies, including connected devices, Alexander likes, and including machine learning. I think we live in a time also when we're capturing data, so we can design this kind of package as well. Can I, can I yeah. ask a question? Yeah. Um, can I just ask a question about who do people trust? Because so much of what we're talking about is trying to get messages across, and you're talking about empowering older adults to look after themselves, which has got to be right. But who do you think people trust to give them those messages? Because it's not government, I'm sure. No, and I think, uh, I don't know. No, no, go ahead, go ahead. I think in, in, in our work with the older generation, we see a, a, a massive difference um, depending on their social economical background. So the more well-off people are, um, the more trusting they'll be into kind of trying some of the technology to help. Where actually when you go, you know, uh, when people are, were on benefit or were supported or coming from less privileged background, that trust was much harder to gain because people were feeling like you, they, they were untrusting from the, from the outset. They were feeling that maybe you want to sell them something or, you know, what you wanted to do was not of good mean. And the work with um, people from a uh, lower social economic background is much harder. Mm -hmm. We found that typically, because we had different segments, we had the older adult themselves or them with a family or carer, it's much easier if you tackle them when they are with their family and carer rather than on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, it's m much, lasting, much more lasting trust mm -hmm. uh, and as well, you know, less risk of having people dropping uh, because they would have heard something on TV and, and you know, they, they gave you the consent but then three months after, th and they've been using it three months after, they hear all of that and they're like, oh, did I do the right thing? So I think th there is a lot to trust uh, in do, general. 
There's a lot of talk in the tech world about this, the unintended consequences, because some of this technology is, it sounds great, you know, and some of the early adopters, they use it, it's great, wonderful, but there's often a lot of unintended consequences, and, and it's not so great. And we often talk about the digital haves, have-nots, we don't want to exacerbate that. So, I don't know, Camilla, do you have a point of view on that, just with the research that you're doing, in terms of, have you seen that in the sort of the tech space where, you know, there's a lot of that, where we, we actually run the risk of it exacerbating some of the social inequalities and the issues that we've got? I think that's sort of what I was trying to get at earlier. I didn't, I didn't put it very well, but when I talked about human technology plus human, and you yeah. do have to go with the grain of where people are at, and I, I think your response just now is really interesting. I mean, for me, it's pretty clear that actually doctors mm -hmm. are some of the most trusted people, mm -hmm. and I think we need to do a huge amount of work to empower, well, encourage doctors to address some of these issues and get across the technology. I think that's going to be key. Um, doctors at the moment don't spend much time on prevention. We can all argue about that, and you know, but equally, I, I think they, doctors could be key connectors to avoid those kind of unintended consequences, uh, or just blocking it out, which is, which is what you're thinking. And uh, Letitia and, and Max, perhaps you can comment on that. What, there may have been some surprises also that you yeah. didn't expect with think, some of the work that you're doing. Yeah, but I think on what Camilla just said, I think it's absolutely. I think we have to recognise first that technology comes as an empowerment of, of humans, and you're absolutely right. I'm, um, sometimes I'm really reluctant to talk about technology thoroughly because it's very geeky and it's getting very exciting and you can satisfy a lot of use cases, but adoption is going to be very low. So mm -hmm. it's just an early adopter kind of you know, uh, funky conversation between engineers. Uh, the reality is you need to acknowledge how the social system is organized and for all the adults it's much more complex. So first you empower social workers, care professionals, doctors, nurses with technology. And the second thing you have to acknowledge also how the system is organized. There's a level of trust here for GPs in the UK which is very high, probably less so in other countries. So you have to play also with the social economic environment. And I think that indeed care professionals remain a very good source of trust. Family is another one. And it has to be talked um, hand in hand. Yeah, and I think the only thing I would add, I do definitely agree that the whole social network, the uh, health network, is, 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 is a primary kind of point of trust. What I did notice, though, in some of our work is if that trust is established outside of the family loop, um, you know, typically it never extends yeah. because typically the older generation don't really want to share their health burden or some of their data or, you know, like they see, they see some of their day-to-day -day as burden to their family. Mm -hmm. So if you don't start tackling it from the outset, it's very difficult to bring family in later on. And Kate, because I know your, the thrust of your research is in the sort of human sort of computer yeah. interaction side. Have you got any comments on this research that's telling you, especially in this situation? Yeah, I think it's interesting. I think there's a couple of things. And, and one is um, around the divide. And as you know, sort of the bias in AI is a massive discussion mm -hmm. point at the moment. Um, we run the risk of entrenching bias when we're not getting data from the right places. So unless we include the end user... Um, that's going to we run the risk of, of isolating people further. And I think in, certainly with the digital divide, there's a, a bunch of people out there who have no access to this tech and whose voices aren't being heard, and I think that's really problematic. And the other is that if we rely, there's the trade-off that if we start relying more heavily on tech, are we then going to see cutbacks in healthcare where they say, well, we can offload that onto a machine now. We don't need to provide um, a carer if we've got a piece of technology that fills its place. So I think there's that risk as well. I'd say that there's yeah. also obviously the obvious issue of privacy. Mm. You had the deep mind collaboration with Royal Free where some of the data leaked. But that, that also comes back to our role in the media. I mean, I'm a journalist, obviously. You know, that is partly about the media. And I think the media haven't always been great at telling this story. So, you know, if, you, if you're one of those old people and all you read is, oh, my God, they're going to take your health data and, and use it, you're not being given the bigger story. And how we tell that story about the power of data and the importance of clinical trials and, all the, and genomics and all those things is, is going to be really important going forward. Well, and there's a, the fake news is in health as well, and that's the problem. So, absolutely. So, um, so there needs to be a more... There needs to be a more informed, grown-up discourse around this whole space. I think just generally. Maybe not. There needs to be a more grown-up conversation, clearly. Um, just uh, another question for Camilla. Was there anything, what were your biggest sort of surprises? Or, or sort of, you know, things that you thought, you know, you had understood, but were really surprised you when you did, the, did your research on your book? There are actually so many. Um, 
One of them, I think, would be in the brain, the space of the brain, where, I, as I said earlier, I talked to a lot of neuroscientists, and I vaguely knew that neuroplasticity, you know, lasts forever and so on. What I didn't realize is that we've got so far down the track of understanding which parts of the brain use memory and which parts of the brain decipher patterns, and that actually we can... Memory loss is not as significant as we imagine it is, because in some cases we can actually use rules and patterns in our brains to keep moving and learning and adapting to situations. And I do think there's some research being done at Cambridge University here, which is really exciting and is very soon going to start suggesting that personalized learning, which we all talk about, may also be divisible by age. So we're going to have to start thinking about different cohorts of people at different ages, learning in different ways and using different parts. That was surprising. The fact that the instance of dementia is falling was a major surprise mm. to me. Um, it doesn't mean it's not a problem, as I said, but it really is fascinating. Nobody knows quite why that is, but it mirrors improvements in heart health. Yeah. Um, and actually, the impact of smoking has been extraordinary as well. So, you know, in the 20th century, we gained 30 years of life expectancy, right, at birth, because we improved infant mortality, we vaccinated, we had better sanitation. But the, the life expectancy at 65 barely budged at all until 1970, when we started giving up smoking. And the impact between 1970 and about 2011 on life expectancy at 65, just from mainly giving up smoking, was, is phenomenal. Now, of course, what we haven't mentioned is that's now stalling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're all talking 100 year life. I mean, actually, what's happening in the States and here is really significant. Life expectancy is, life expectancy growth is stalling here in the States, as you know, partly because of opioids, it's actually going backwards. Mm -hmm. So, we have to address that mm -hmm. issue too. And again, nobody is quite sure exactly what is going on, but part of it is definitely obesity. Mm -hmm. And um, I guess that was also a surprise to me, having, you know, having worried about obesity for many years, the extent to which that really is now beginning to impact mm -hmm. yeah. on life expectancy itself. Absolutely. So one thing that you mentioned, Camilla, and has come up a couple of times, it's, and it's connected, I think, you know, this whole notion around lifelong learning, and that's one way of keeping active you know, uh, mentally and, and in your brain. And just a question for Let Letitia, whether that's something that you're looking at and exploring in some of these technologies, you know, keeping people mentally active, this whole sort of learning aspect, and how you connect it with purpose with some of the work that you're doing. On the connection, one of the surprises we've had is, obviously we were uh, design-led, so we had more than 100 people taking part into uh, the design process, and, you know, there were 65 plus. Mm -hmm. And, and I guess one of the surprises is we created a community <laughs> of people very actively, uh, like a real community. I think the real community benefit was uh, as good as, you know, um, you know, defining the product. You know, I think we underestimated completely that created that community was going to establish a number of link with those people, and they were coming in uh, really happy and and keeping some friendships. So we still have uh, the community quite active and friendly with each other. And um, I think sometimes we want to digitalize a lot of everything, but there's still a lot of value into you know, them meeting up physically and all of mm -hmm. that. And, and I think a lot of the learning and, and things happen as well within those newly created community in some way. Yeah. Can, can I pick up on that? Yeah, quickly? Kate, and then I've got just, another question. On. Um, just to say, so when I was looking at um, how, how tech, people, people, a lot of people say tech will isolate us. You know, we're all just looking at our tech and we're not integrating. And I, I think that's a myth. I think that tech actually brings us closer together. There are edge cases where that's not quite the same, they're outliers, but um, one of the things I found was that people were, who we thought were isolated are forming communities with each other via tech, and that's a really, really strong thing, and it's through companionship and through, te through online communities. There's a huge connection um, that is just as beneficial in many cases. Have you, uh, I mean, where do you see the future in that? In this, the community building. I think that we've always, since the birth of the internet, since the birth of the web, we've, mm. we've seen people find their tribes online, and, and mm. it's a really, really nice thing to do. We find other people we're connected to. So I still think there's definitely scope to do that. And if we, I don't think that technology should be replacing human contact, mm. um, but we can certainly augment it, enhance it, and keep people connected when there isn't an alternative. And just a question, actually picking up, this is from Max and Letitia, but uh, Camilla might want to pick up on this. So we hear a lot about the power of voice technology and, of course, where it can go, digital, digital biomarkers, dementia, 
Is that part of your plan, you know, sort of using that data to really kind of explore that hot end of, you know, dementia research, you know, collecting this data to identify um, the risks of all these horrible yeah. diseases? I think, I think there's plenty to do with, yeah. with sound overall. <clears throat> so we're looking at, we're testing a couple of devices actually right now, which is sound recognition to identify issues in the house. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be chest infection, it could be urinary tract infection. Mm -hmm. So basically we're more on the medical side of infection saying, well, by the way she coughs or the way we identify her behavior, we know that there, there are maybe a couple of infections or medical issues. Mm -hmm. So that, that's number one on, on the prevention side, but it's already quite powerful. Mm -hmm. It's quite hard, but quite powerful. Then there's the interaction side. Mm -hmm. So indeed nudging on all the adults who interact with the machine, um, whether she talks to the machine and so on and so on, whether she gives order to the machine. And there you have plenty of different possibilities. I think one is connection, indeed. Uh, the other one is services or emergency or support. And the third one is stimulation. Um, and, and really on, on three aspects there's a lot. On stimulation, I think you mentioned dementia, you can do a lot to identify early patterns of dementia just by the tone of voice. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can actually stimulate and work with the patient to make sure that you reduce, the, I mean, you lower the, the level of decline, if you wish. Um, and there's a lot of technologies out there already available. The question is how do you push them in the house? Yeah. Yeah. And Letitia, is that part of your... Yes, the, well, we have a cohort with the NHS Essex partnership, uh, university partnership, which is actually dementia, a uh, group of people with early onset dementia and their carer. Um, and we definitely see that there is a lot of benefit into that type of technology. One other thing I wanted to say is voice is voice AI is definitely an enabler uh, for you know the aging population. But typically, the the normal Alexa or the Google Home which freak them out because there's just a little microphone in a corner and they would think there's somebody spying on them. We found much more successful to have a, a, a UI interface uh, as well as the voice. So we prefer the Echo Show or the new Google with a screen because actually the aging population kind of like that much better. But also we find that working on a vision and the sound as two combined channel is much more effective because typically you know they may have speed challenges um, which we, you, you actually can cover with the screen or vice versa um, and, and I guess this is just a much more complete uh, solution for them to be able to access some of the services you do offer. So, did you want to comment? Uh, well there, there's a robot in Japan called Robocon which is basically a, a, a mobile phone on legs. Yeah. And it's, it's brilliant because people relate, people find it much easier to relate to. It looks like a sort of small black and white cute monkey and it's, it's very interesting what you said. Old people have no problem with Robohan sitting on their bedside table or sitting in the passenger seat of the car where it will soon be able to warn you of oncoming obstacles. Mm. So I'm, 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 we're running out of time so I've got one more question which I'm going to ask all of you. Um, it strikes me and you hear about the wisdom that we've accumulated over the ages, you know, get your sleep, eat your greens, get, you know, get out and get some exercise. It's almost like it's coming back in a, in a, in a different way. Um, so I wanted to ask you the question, I mean, is it going to be that, just listening to our grandmothers, or technology that's really going to give us those five extra years that we've been talking about in this national strategy for healthy longevity that we mentioned earlier. What do you think, Kate? I think it's going to be that. It's going to be the advice, but it's going to be helped by technology. So we can use the technology to help us achieve the goals rather than replace the things that we need to do. Okay. Camilla? Look, I think it's going to be both, but I also think, back to the story I told at the very beginning about David Sinclair at Harvard Medical School, we have to start treating aging as a disease. And that will unlock pharmaceutical money, it will unlock R&D, because it will accept that actually if we just combat one disease, we're only going to gain you know, a couple of years. If we start to treat aging as a disease in itself, it unlocks huge possibility. Mm -hmm. Great. I also think it's both. Um, I guess my key concern at the moment is how do you raise awareness and scale all of this up um, you know, in a equal way. I think the commercial sector has to do something, you know, as you go to, you know, your telephone provider to buy the latest iPhone or whatever tech, you know, 
why wouldn't you have something to kind of you know put in the in the house of your grandmother to kind of you know have a con a bit of connected home and subscriptions you know to help that healthy aging i think we all you know it's not only the government and it's to do something i think we as a society need to kind of start you know having those products commercially available so we can help the change um because at the moment it's not going any fast <laughs> Max, what do you no, think? I absolutely agree with what I said earlier. I think it's the same topic as healthcare. Yeah. So basically, it's you have. I think it's really both. We are in charge, but like technology is helping us to have access to knowledge to everyone, and not only to the few happy. To actually have tailored knowledge. That means that knowledge is designed for me and tells me what I need to do, what, I might, what my needs are. And then in a much better way, it's delivered in a much better way. In other words, you know, it's gamified. I can track it. I have full visibility. I'm nudged. And I think that's what technology does. The, the old-fashioned tips, but personalized, with better access and better delivered. Yeah. Fantastic. So I think we've got a very good overview of what will you know, help us live longer, healthier lives. And it seems pretty clear you know, there is a role for you know, government, there's a role for, for business, certainly, and of course, there's a huge role for all of us as citizens to kind of, you know, d listen to what our grandmother said and eat your greens. Um, so, yes, yeah, so with that, I'd just like to um, thank you uh, to all our panelists, give a huge round of applause. We're going to have a meet the, the speaker session just at the back there.